we are going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. If you're new to the Bible and you're wondering where in the world is 1 Peter chapter 1, there's a table of contents at the very beginning of the Bible. Or if you turn almost all the way to the back of your Bible, you will find 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be looking specifically at verses 3 through 9. So as you're getting there, uh, last week, Pastor Dave kind of launched the 2019 New Year with a sermon on the importance of God-centered vision, God-centered vision. And really, the reason why is because to start off our new year, we need to be setting goals or we need to be living a life that builds upon the rock who is Jesus Christ. And Pastor Dave talked about how God-centered vision gives life purpose. How many of you have ever wondered, what is my purpose in life? Anybody? Like three of you. So everyone else has it figured out. (laughs) What is my purpose? What is my identity? Where does my security come from? God-centeredness helps to answer those questions. God-centered vision also helps us to properly place our priorities where they need to be. A lot of us get so busy and so wrapped up in everything that's going on between life and work and relationships and family and friends and finances that having a God-centered vision can help us organize our priorities in a right and honoring way to the Lord. And then finally, Pastor Dave talked about how God-centered vision gives pain a purpose. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands for this one, but if you were to reflect back on 2018... How many of you experienced incredible pain, difficult circumstances, hardship? There is a purpose for that pain. And when our eyes are set on Christ, he will teach us and show us what the purpose of that pain pain is. And as we move forward into this week, I wanted to take some time to look at the heart of repentance And repentance is one of those words that probably is up there with submission and discipline. It kind of carries a negative connotation. It's not something that most people would say, I love discipline, I love submission, or I love repentance. And yet, for the life of the believer, for the follower of Jesus Christ, repentance is a significant aspect of our faith that leads us to salvation. As we look at 1 Peter this morning, we're going to be hearing from the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' close followers, and we're going to read a passage that comes from Peter at a point in his life when his heart, his soul, had been shipwrecked on the rocks of his own sin. He had seen who he truly was, and it broke him to the point of not just theologically knowing that a Messiah was coming but discovering his true need for a savior by coming to the end of himself. Something that God pursued him and pursued him and pursued him until Peter reaches that point of self-denial for the purpose of glorifying Jesus, his savior. And so we begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and we'll read this whole section. Peter says this to the church, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten or has recreated us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith For salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, You love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. 
How did Peter come to write such a thing? There's a lot of theological knowledge in here, but even more importantly than just theological knowledge, Peter writes this from a place of experience. He writes this from a lifetime of being in relationship with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What Peter is writing came at a cost. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at Peter's life, kind of from a 30,000-foot level, and go through his story of how he came to a place where he could be encouraging the church about God's abundant mercy, about how through trials and tribulation, God uses that pain to mold and shape us and bring us to the end of ourselves so that in our faith, at the end, we would receive the salvation for our souls. Before we get started in the life of Peter, I want to clarify a few things. We're going to look at Peter's life and some of his aspects of sinfulness that he needed to be delivered from. By no means do I think that Peter was not already saved as he was following Jesus in his public ministry, and yet there was much growth for Peter to have. I also believe it's important that we look at this as this is not a time for us simply just to look at someone else's life and say, boy, Peter was really struggling here. But for us to understand that the life of Peter is the life of every believer. Maybe some different circumstances, different time period, different history. But in terms of what Peter experienced, it is the same for you and me if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, if you're someone who goes, yeah, I haven't, I haven't made that commitment to bow my knee to King Jesus, I encourage you just to listen this morning. To listen to a man who was a good man, a good friend, a bold individual who did his best in his own strength to walk with Jesus and fell short. And then his Savior, Jesus Christ, lifted him up out of the depths of his own depravity to bring his soul into saving grace. On the surface, the Apostle Peter was an amazing, bold, wonderful friend. When we look at his earthly life while he was walking with Jesus, we may call him the most faithful disciple. We may call him the most brave disciple. As a matter of fact, we believe that Peter was married and had kids before Jesus called him, so that when Jesus called him, he left his family in a sense, not altogether, but he gave up a lot of time in order to follow Jesus. We also know that Jesus called him out of a successful fishing business in which he had employees, he was making a good living, and Jesus says, let me teach you to become fishers of men, come and follow me. And Peter left his nets literally on the shore and went to follow Jesus for three years. How many of you remember the story of Peter walking on water by a show of hands? So there's the storm, and the disciples are in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and the waves are raging, and the wind is blowing, and they're afraid that they're going to sink, and Jesus comes out on the water, and Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me out. And God says, Jesus says to Peter, come to me. And what does Peter do? He walks out of the boat and actually walks on water. And then what happens? He, he, he doubts, takes his eyes off Jesus. But how many of you have walked on water? Not me. As a matter of fact, I was on the Sea of Galilee back in 2006 with my family. And there was an incredible storm that happened while we were on the boat. This is not made up. This is true. Huge waves, lightning and thunder, and I looked at my dad and I was like, you get out first. <laughs> Neither of us stepped out of the boat. Peter was brave and bold. Peter is the first one that we see in Matthew chapter 16 who confesses verbally that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the King. And Jesus says, Peter... Man has not revealed this to you. It's not in your own strength, but God has revealed this to you. Jesus also said in Matthew 16 that he would build his church using Peter, the little rock. 
he pays Peter this incredibly high compliment that I will use you to help build my kingdom. Peter witnesses what's known as the transfiguration on the mount where Jesus meets with Moses, Elijah, and for a temporary time is, receives his glory, his, his Shekinah shining, the beauty of the heavenly Savior. Peter gets to witness this. And then finally, something that most of you know, in Matthew 26, Peter is the only disciple who physically tries to defend Jesus from being unjustly arrested. You guys remember that story? Judas comes and he betrays Jesus with a kiss on the cheek and someone reaches out to take Jesus and Peter draws his sword and what does he do? He cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. That's because Peter was a bad swordsman. Remember, he's a fisherman. He was aiming for the head and only got the ear. That's probably what happened. Peter was a good friend. He wanted to help his friend Jesus. Peter does so many things on the surface that are right. He's a good guy. He's a loyal follower. He's bold and strong. On the outside, Peter gave the appearance of being a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ, but there was much on the inside that was lacking. When I reflect on my own life, I can go back to a large season of time where I grew up in the church. I sat here week in and week out. I could tell you all the Bible stories. I had good knowledge of the scriptures. I knew the language. I was a good guy. I'm like one of those guys that I would go back to junior high and high school again. I was nice to everybody. I don't mind seeing people. And I went to Valley Junior High and Carlsbad High School. I was a really good guy. And you want to know why I was a really good guy? Nobody. <laughs> Moving on. You want to know why I was a really good guy? It was for my own glory. It was for myself. Because what I realized at a young age is that if I got good grades, if I was obedient to my parents, if I went to church, if I was nice to people, if I was a good hard worker, whether it was at sports or school or in the jobs that I had, people liked me. I liked being liked. How many of you liked being liked? Probably most of us do, I hope. It was for myself. It was for my glory. It was for my own path of accomplishing the things that I wanted to do with my life. In our own strength, in our own knowledge, in our own ways, we are capable of playing the game that looks like being a dedicated inward and outward follower of Jesus Christ. But we can fool others. We can even fool ourselves, but who can't we fool? We can't fool God. And Peter, according to the scriptures, was a man who I believe he had the best of intentions. I had the best of intentions of being a good guy. I didn't even realize I was living for myself until God brought me to the end of myself until he broke me so that I could see my own reflection in the mirror of the sinful, wretched mess that I was who needed a savior. Peter went through a period of his life where think about what he was doing. He was basically telling Jesus, you need me. Your boy Peter, you need me. And Jesus had to bring him to a place where Peter said, you don't need me. I need you. He did that in my life. But there was pain. And there was brokenness. And there was an understanding that I had fallen short. And that my goodness, my ni niceness, my own righteousness, as the Apostle Paul says, was filthy rags. It's garbage. Could never amount to enough compared to what Christ is and has done for me. So I ask this question, 
in all genuineness and not to pick a fight, but just for self-reflection for you. Are you a surface-level Christian? Outwardly, are you doing the good things that we are called to do as followers of Christ? But where is your heart? Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you know and experience and understand the need for a Savior because you are not enough? Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17 says this, You do not desire a sacrifice, O Lord, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. God has a desire for us to receive the fullness of his blessing. And that comes through reaching a point of repentance, not just asking forgiveness for when we do something wrong. How many of you know that when you do something bad, you should ask for forgiveness? If you're married, raise your hand, right? When I mess up with my wife, I better ask for forgiveness. But here's the thing, is I think consciously we all know that, but what about a heart that not just when we do bad things, but even in times where we feel like we're doing well, do we still have a repentant heart? Do we still come before the Lord and say, God, I am not worthy, I have fallen short, and even though I think I'm good, I know I'm not good, so help me to walk in humility. Help me to walk in brokenness. Help me to have a humble spirit before you. That's the heart of repentance. I want to look at a few areas of Peter's life that reveal in his life and in my life and maybe your life the glorification of self. Multiple times in the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples what's going to happen to him. As a matter of fact, three times he says, the Son of Man, that's what he calls himself, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of the Jewish leaders beaten and stricken, and then he's going to die and be crucified. Jesus lets his disciples in on what is coming, and listen to Peter's response in Matthew 16. It'll be up on the screens here. It says, But Peter took Jesus aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. What is Peter doing? He's being a good friend, right? Okay, this isn't a trick question. If your best friend came to you and said, hey, listen, um, later on, like this car's going to come and nobody's going to help me and I'm going to get run over, what would you say? (laughs) Some of you are like, I don't know what I would say. (laughs) If you could stop it, would you? That's all Peter's trying to do. He's being human. He's being a good friend. He's going, no, 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 Jesus, no. There's no way on my watch that that's going to happen to you. I'm going to protect you. I'm not going to let them take you. I'm not going to let that happen to you. I'll stand in the gap for you. Did Peter have good intentions? You bet he had good intentions. But he saw things from a wrong perspective. Look at Jesus' response. Jesus says this to Peter. Get away from me, Satan. How many of you have been called Satan this week? Probably not most of us. You think this got Peter's attention? You think he was a little confused at what Jesus was responding to him with? Jesus says this, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Now, I'd like a show of hands on this. How many of you feel like Jesus is being a little harsh by calling Peter Satan when Peter's just trying to help? Yeah, for sure, right? Like, dang, Jesus, lighten up. The dude's trying to help you out. But think about this. Peter is seeking his own way for his own glory because he doesn't want his friend to go through something that God has planned. Here's why he gets called Satan. When we go back to the scriptures and we look at how Satan became Satan, he used to be called Lucifer. 
And he was one of God's most beautiful angels. And the problem is, is that Lucifer was jealous of the worship of God. And so he tried to put himself in the place of God so that he could receive glory and worship. And God cast him down and so became Satan, the deceiver, the destroyer, because he sought his own glory above God's. Peter is doing something no different than Satan did, no different than if we go back to the Garden of Eden, what Adam and Eve did. God had provided them with everything they needed. And he gave them one command. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, the tempter, came and told Eve, God doesn't want you to be like him and know the difference between good and evil. Because on the day that you eat of this fruit, you will become like God. And Eve and Adam, who was responsible for his wife, entered into the same sin that Satan did, trying to take God's place because they wanted their path and their own glory. So that as we go back to the life of Peter, he's simply falling into the same sin that Satan, Adam, and Eve, and I think it's fair to say that we do too, when we seek our own ways above God's ways, we glorify ourselves. Jesus says this, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. What do you have to give up? What do you have to give up? Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your own soul? Hold on to that question. Is there anything worth more than your own soul? Another time in the Gospels, Jesus and his disciples are about Jerusalem and a rich young ruler comes to Jesus. How many of you know the story of the rich young ruler? This rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He's an educated man, both theologically and in academics. He's wealthy. He's well-respected in the community. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Rabbi, teacher, how can I inherit? What do I need to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And the young man says, oh, good news. I've done that since the time I was a kid. I've always followed the law. Is there anything else I need to do? And Jesus says, yes, go and sell everything that you have and then come and follow me. And the scriptures tell us that the young man went away sad because he had much to lose. What I love about this is that Jesus isn't telling all of us to sell everything that we have, literally, although he may call some. But what he saw was that finances, wealth, it provided this man identity and security. And Jesus went straight to the heart and said, this is gripping you too tightly. Give it to me so that you can truly be my follower. And the man couldn't let go of his things. And so Peter witnesses this whole interaction between Jesus and the rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler goes off and Peter goes, hey, we've left everything to follow you. And listen to what he says in Matthew 19, 27. Then Peter said to Jesus, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? What do we get out of this? Now, how many of you would like to know the answer to that question? I mean, what Peter is really pointing out, we have to we got to take off our church hats and put on our human hats. If you are sacrificing in order to get something, don't you want to know what you're going to get? <laughs> Some of you are like, trick question, huh? I knew it. No! If you're going to spend two grand on a TV, you want to know what that TV can do? Heck yeah, I better make chocolate chip cookies and do a lot of other things so you can get what you need out of it. 
When we invest in something, we want to know what the return is going to be. That's all Peter is asking. Except do you notice the heart of his question? We, he says, we've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Who is Peter pointing to of the good works? It's himself. Look at everything we've done. What have we earned? What, have we, what do we get from this transaction of sacrifice and following you? Peter was in the habit of glorifying self. A life of following Christ is not so much about what we get. It's about what has been given, not because of our own righteousness, not because of anything we've done, but by grace we have been saved through what? Through faith, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We have nothing to boast about. On the night that Jesus would be betrayed, Jesus warns his disciples. He tells them, hey, the time is coming. I'm going to be betrayed, and all of you, all of my closest followers, the guys I've hung out with for three years, you're all going to abandon me. And in Matthew 26, 33, Peter gives him this response. Even if all are made to stumble... Because of you. And Peter's just saying, listen, even if all these other guys run away, I will never be made to stumble. I'm not going anywhere, Jesus. I'm going to stay right here. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter again said to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And then all the disciples said the same. Good intentions from Peter? You bet. Do you think he meant to do that? Yes, he did. He believed in his own strength, in his own boldness, in his own bravery, that he could do it. He could die with Jesus. He would stand in the gap when things got hard. He thought very highly of himself. you're taking notes this morning, write this down. Glorifying self leads to denying Jesus. Glorifying self leads to denying Jesus. It's very black and white. If you are lifting yourself up, if you are seeking your own way, when you glorify yourself, the counter to that is that you deny Jesus. Sadly, as most of you know, Matthew 26, in the latter part of the chapter, tells us that later on when Jesus had been arrested and taken to Caiaphas' house, the high priest, he was brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, and he was put on trial. And Jesus kind of sneaks into the courtyard of Caiaphas' house to see what happens. And a, a little servant girl, the Bible says a little servant girl, not a Roman soldier, not someone equipped with weapons or some buff, handsome guy looking like me. That was a joke. It's okay. A little servant girl comes and says, hey, you are a follower of Jesus. And what does Peter say? I don't know him. And then a second time, another servant girl comes and says, yeah, wait a minute, I've seen you with Jesus. And Peter says, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. And then finally, a third person comes to Peter and says, hey, your accent betrays you. You're a Galilean, you're with Jesus. And he says, I swear I do not know the man. And then the rooster crows. Painful? You bet. Oh, what sorrow does await Self-righteous hearts, a humbling fate. Come face to face with wretched sin. Your eyes behold the depraved self within. Peter is brought to the end of himself. In all his pride, his strength, 
his arrogance, he falls. He crumbles under the pressure. He thought he could do it, and instead he's found to be weak, a pretender, sinful, foolish, afraid. He seeks his own self-preservation over Christ. Peter is human. I am human. We are human. We have a fallen nature that glorifies self. Jesus needed to bring Peter to the end of himself so that Peter could see who he truly was because he thought of himself as this bold, loyal, amazing man. And there are aspects of Peter that there's no question that he was. But he needed to see who he truly was because he needed more than anything to know he needed a savior. And that was Jesus. So what now? Peter's denied Christ three times. The thing that he swore he would never do. How many of us here swore we would never hurt our spouse? How many of us swore we wouldn't be like our parents when we parented our own kids? How many of us thought or made promises or had the best of intentions to do good and we messed it all up? This is the life of Peter. So what now? Luke 22 60 and 62 gives an incredibly sobering and wonderful passage of what happened with Peter. In reference to Peter's third denial, the third time he's telling somebody, I don't know who Jesus is, it says, immediately while he was still speaking, while the words were still dripping with lies and fear from his mouth, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned And looked at Peter. Who looked at Peter? Oh my goodness. Peter is caught in his lie. And he makes eye contact with who? Can you imagine? Have you ever looked into the eyes of someone that you hurt deeply? And seen what that does to them? Probably all of us have. In some way. I can't imagine what it would be like to look into the eyes of the person who came to give his life for you. And the question becomes, what kind of look do you think Jesus gave Peter? You know what look I give people when they mess with me? (laughs) Or when my kid does something wrong? The dad scowl comes out. Anybody know what the dad scowl is? You're like. (laughs) And right away, my kid's like. The the other kid. (laughs) That's not. I doubt that's what the look of Jesus was toward Peter. I imagine that the look Jesus gave Peter was deeply convicting. And also deeply loving knowing that Peter had come to the end of himself. He saw himself for who he was finally. Broken, messed up, in need of being rescued. Right where God wants to get each one of us. And the crazy thing is, we're not even talking about salvation here. That can happen at the moment of salvation when you come to Christ, But I would argue that this will happen over and over and over and over again in our lifetime. Because how many things do I glorify myself with that need to be ripped from me? And I go, oh my God, what have I been doing with my life? What are the areas of your life that you need to be brought to the end of yourself? Think about the church at large building its own personal kingdoms on programs or the personalities of pastors. 
The church at large needs to be brought to the end of itself. A place where transparency and brokenness is the norm. And we don't see ourselves above another church or above other people. But we understand our need for a savior. Notice in Luke 22, it says, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter is reminded by this look from Jesus of what he said would happen, and it does. And it says, So Peter went out and wept bitterly. What is Peter's response to what happens? It says he weeps bitterly. Now, we're going to read a little bit in between the lines here because I think in Western Christianity, when we think of prayer or we think of repentance, we kind of wrap it up in a nice, neat box, don't we? Like, if you want to see good prayers, you watch little kids, right? Fold hands. What's next? Close eyes. And then what comes next? Dear Jesus, right? Dear Jesus. Now, it's not wrong to pray that way. But the problem is, is sometimes we get caught up in that is prayer alone. You have to be sitting somewhere in a quiet closet. No, prayer is messy, right? You ever read the Psalms? David's like on the run from Saul because he's trying to kill him. He's like, God, where are you? What are you doing? I need help. I know that you're sovereign. I know that you're good. I know that I can trust you, but I feel abandoned. That's prayer. What about repentance? Repentance isn't just simply going, wow, I really messed up. This is emotionally about to affect me right now. I should probably sit down and be like, dear Jesus, please forgive me. Now, should we ask for forgiveness? You bet. But what happens when you experience pain? What happens when you get into those times where you're broken and your heart just goes, bleh? It is not formal. It is not pretty. You guys have heard of the ugly cry, right? That's, that's brokenness. That's Peter. Have you been broken? Because brokenness and coming to the end of yourself where you say, I want to deny myself, is exactly where God is trying to get us because it leads to repentance. A broken spirit, a broken heart is a repentant heart. It's one that seeks after God first above self, recognizing that we need him above all things. Repentance is a powerful punch to the spiritual gut. Repentance is heart change, not just knowledge up here of, I'm sorry. It's, it's the inward, oh, I can't believe that I did that. And I can't believe that Jesus forgives me and God help me. It's an inward change. Repentance is the result of death to self. It's a deep conviction from God's spirit. How long did Peter weep bitterly? Hours, days? Can you imagine the last time he looked at Jesus, he was denying him, and then Jesus dies on the cross, and Peter doesn't get any more interaction with him. How do you think that made Peter feel? You think he was as down as down gets? <laughs> I won't ask you to raise your hands for this question, but how many of you beat yourself up when you mess up? <laughs> People still raise their hands. Go ahead. We are notorious for beating ourselves up. I bet you Peter beat himself up for those three days that Jesus was in the grave. I bet you he was so disgusted with himself. And yet the beauty of what we see in the story of Christ is that he rose up from the dead and he interacted with Peter. There was an opportunity for restoration, but first had to come the brokenness. Francois Fenelon was the archbishop in Western Europe during the 1700s, and he had an interesting position uh, one of his positions in the Catholic Church was be, to be the tutor for Louis XIV. And in this time period, uh, what was going on in the French court was 
royal debauchery. It was wealth to the extravagant fullest. It was sleeping with everybody you possibly could. It was doing whatever you wanted because you were royalty. And Francois Fenelon, as clergy at this time, had an interesting job. He was to minister to the royalty because religion was still a part of royal life. And so Francis, Francois Fenelon would get these letters from courtiers about how am I supposed to live in this wicked world and yet follow Jesus? Because to be honest with you, this feels a lot better and is a lot easier than denying myself and walking the path of Christ. What am I supposed to do? How do I live that way? And Francois answered one of the courtiers with this quote. He said, God loves you since he does not spare you, but lays upon you the cross of Jesus Christ. How do you know that you're loved? Because the Savior calls you to die to yourself, just like Jesus did. Whatever light, whatever feeling we may possess is all a delusion if it lead us not to the real and constant practice of dying to self. He who sees in us what we cannot see, meaning God who sees in us what we cannot see, knows full well where the blow should fall. He takes away that which we are most reluctant to give up. Just like Jesus and that rich young ruler, God will take from us what we are most reluctant to give up for the purpose of bringing us to the end of ourselves. If you're taking notes this morning, the denial of self leads to the glorifying of Jesus. The denial of self leads to the glorifying of Jesus. Not an easy path, a painful path, a broken path, but a path that we'll see as we go back to 1 Peter in just a moment that leads to the salvation of your soul. Uh, for Christmas, uh, my wife's dad got our family two days and a night at a hotel to take our four kids to Disneyland, which is both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> so my eight-year-old, seven-year-old, five-year-old, and three-year-old spent two days at Disneyland. And you want to talk about a place to glorify self. Wow! It's amazing, especially through the eyes of a young child. And I got to watch my kids. Daddy, can I have this? No, son, you can't have that. Dad, can I have this? No, son, you can't have that. Daddy, can I have this? Sweetie, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> having a girl is different than having a boy. <laughs> but there was a lot of opportunity where my wife and I had to tell my kids, no, we're, we're not going to do that. But that's what they wanted. That's what they saw and wanted to go after. And yet I was able to watch even my young kids deny themselves because they trusted their father that he had what was best in mind for them. God calls us to nothing different. No, son, no, daughter. You can't have that. Do we trust our heavenly father? Are we willing to deny ourselves for the purpose of glorifying Jesus? Let's go back to the passage that we started with in 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen to verse 3. Peter says this to the church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy. Do you think Peter understood abundant mercy at this point in his life? You bet he did. He's not just writing something that is for academia or for theology. Peter is writing about the abundant mercy because he experienced it. It's real and tangible to him. The life that he led, what he was forgiven through repentance, he's able to write about the abundant mercy of God, that God has created us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In John chapter 21, there's this kind of amazing conclusion 
in this earthly relationship between Peter and Jesus. Peter and the disciples, after Jesus was crucified and then buried, went back to fishing. They went back to what they knew. And they'd been fishing all night long. And someone yells from the shore, try fishing over there. I go, all right. I haven't caught anything anyways. And all of a sudden, their nets are full of fish. And who does Peter realize is on the shore? Oh, it's Jesus. And it's so neat. It's like plays out like a movie of Peter's kind of like in his Speedo at this point. And he gets his, his jacket or his coat. And it says he jumps off the boat into the water and swims for shore because he can't wait to see Jesus. And Jesus has a fire and he's already made bread and he tells Peter, get some fish, I'll cook it for you. And the disciples are all sitting down to a breakfast with the risen Savior and Jesus talks to Peter. And he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And here's the beauty of what's going on. In the English language, we use the word love for a lot of things. In Greek, there's four different words for love. And the word that Jesus uses in this question for love is agape love, which is, it's more than like uh, a friend love, which is phileo, or eros, which is more of the passionate lusts of the flesh. It's the deepest kind of love that you can have for someone. It's beyond the physical. And Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Now, old Peter would have said what? Bah! Of course I do. I'm Peter, your best buddy. But what Peter responds is, yes, Lord, I like you a lot. <laughs> it's kind of funny. He uses the term phileo instead of agape. But Jesus asks again, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me? And Peter says, Jesus, you know I like you a lot. Why did Peter respond that way? Because he knew that in his own strength, he could never love Jesus in the way that Jesus was saying he needed to be loved by us. He had come to the end of himself. He realized that he wasn't good enough and that he couldn't do it on his own. And so Jesus asks him a third time, Peter, do you like me? And Peter goes, Lord, you know my heart. I like you a lot. And Jesus knows that Peter was willing to deny himself in order to glorify Jesus. How did this happen? How did Peter go from being someone who glorified himself to someone who denied himself to follow Christ? A few weeks ago, Pastor Dave gave a sermon and he talked about how life is a spiritual battlefield. We see things often from the outside perspective of what we can and can't do with the resources we have or don't have. We often judge ourselves or others based on the outward way they talk or things that they do, but it's difficult to see inward, isn't it? Even with ourselves sometimes, it's difficult to see inward. Listen to what Jesus said to Peter before he went to the cross. Peter in his own strength is saying, no, I'm never going to deny you. I'm never going to give up. I'm going to fight for you. I'll even die with you, Jesus. And Jesus says this, Simon, Simon, or Peter, Peter, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Who prayed for Peter? Oh my goodness, Jesus but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. John chapter 17 is called Jesus' high priestly prayer. Jesus not only addresses the disciples, but he addresses all those in the future who would follow after him, that they are his I want to encourage you this morning that the same prayer that Jesus prayed for Peter, he prays for you. That in the messiness of our lives, in the self-glorification, Satan will not win because through repentance, which God allows us to have through his grace, 
He is keeping us safe. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, this passage we began with. You who are kept by the power of God. Whose power keeps you? It's God's power. It's not Peter's strength. It's not your strength. It's God's strength. The power of God who kept you through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What I love about this is how many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter if he loved him? Three times. It's redeemed. It is finished. If you're taking notes this morning, repentance is our response to redemption. A repentant heart is not merely one that looks at the outside wrong that we do. A repentant heart is one that when we're not doing anything wrong, we still look in the inside and go, God, I need you desperately. Romans 1 tells us there is no one good. No, not even one. A repentant heart is constantly, regardless of your behavior, kneeling before Jesus, knowing that you need a Savior. First Peter chapter 1 continues. In faith for salvation, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, What did Peter experience in his life once he began denying himself? Beatings and persecution and trial and trouble from both inside and outside of the church. And then eventually Peter was crucified upside down. Remember that time Peter asked Jesus after the rich young ruler had gone away, we've left everything to follow you. What do we get? That's a tough sell, isn't it? What you get is beatings and persecution and trials and troubles and pain and then to die a horrible death? It's not going to sell many tickets. But listen to the rest of of that passage that we read early this morning. Jesus, whom having not seen, meaning we don't see him like Peter saw him on earth, you love. Peter's encouraging you. If you love Jesus and you haven't even seen Jesus, boy, your faith is above mine. Though now you do not see him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. And what is the end of your faith? The salvation of your souls. Yes, Peter received a difficult life when he denied himself. But what does that compare to the salvation of your soul? It doesn't. It's the joy, it's the blessing, it's the guarantee and the promise that we get to receive as followers of Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with this this morning. The death of self is the beginning of new life. Repentance leads to new life. My encouragement to you is, just like the word discipline or the word submission, Don't let repentance be a word with a negative connotation. Peter experienced deep repentance when he came to the end of himself, when he was willing to give up his way in order to glorify Jesus. And then he experienced an incredible life of joy despite his trials and circumstances. For some of you here, whatever trials you're experiencing, you may not see deliverance from them in the way you would like to. And that's painful. 
Don't stop praying. Don't stop seeking what God can do through that pain and that, those trials. But the promise is eternal. The promise is now. That despite the circumstances, you will find new life through the denial of self and incredible joy that only comes through Jesus Christ.